November 16th, 1987, a Monday morning. A pair of hunters were making their way through the woods south of Eureka, South Carolina. They were roughly a mile and a half south of the intersection where highways 191 and 208 meet, the roads called Johnston Highway and Mount Calvary Road, respectively. If you are familiar with this area of South Carolina, you are more than likely familiar with the body of water that flows through these woods, named Shaw Creek. These two hunters were coming across a patch of forest not more than a stone's throw away from this creek when they stumbled upon an unmistakable object, a find unlike any other. The white skeletal remains, barely even covered up by the soil around them, were lying face down, with their legs crossed and their arms outstretched. Whoever the victim had been, she had been left there in the preceding years, without any articles of clothing or any belongings. The police officer who would respond roughly half an hour later that morning would note that the remains looked posed, in a way. The remains were discovered to have been there for some time, with roots growing over the bones of the fingers. No insects were found near the body, which implied that it had decomposed at least a year beforehand. Police would theorize that they had been there between one and five years. In addition, several of the bones from the foot could not be found, as well as the segment of the neck known as the hyoid. Authorities responded that morning, taking away the remains for further examination. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, also known as SLED, was there to help conduct a search of the area and would help in the coming weeks and months in trying to identify the remains. A metal detector was run over the crime scene in the hopes of locating any clues. They would find just one, a brass shell casing, which had been fired by a shotgun. It was found in the soil underneath the body, and contained none of the plastic or paper casing found in other, more modern shotgun shells. Over the coming weeks and months, several things would become known. Led by Aiken County Coroner Sue Townsend, authorities would learn that the victim had high cheekbones, indicating a heritage that was predominantly black but may have included European, Indian, or even Caribbean influence. Whoever she was, she stood between 5 feet 8 inches tall and 5 foot 10, and she weighed approximately 150 to 160 pounds. The scar tissue from her remains showed that she had also led an active life, to say the least. The left side of her nose had likely been fractured at some point, and then given time to heal. There was some kind of healed injury to her right knee. The first molar on the lower right side of her mouth had been removed early in her life. She was missing at least four other teeth at the time of her death, and she had a pronounced overbite. More importantly, at least for investigators, her hair tested positive for cocaine. This would open up many avenues for investigators to locate her identity, but over time would merely reduce the pool of candidates namely to missing sex workers and drug addicts from the area, which included both South Carolina and Northern Georgia. Police originally theorized that she may have been a migrant worker who'd gone missing from a nearby farm. A particular farm owner from the surrounding area had been fined in the past for violations pertaining to migrant workers. He had no known farmers during this time period, but police kept him on their radar for some time. Not as a suspect, mind you, but as a potential lead for finding the identity of this woman. Perhaps she had worked there years beforehand and suddenly disappeared, or something like that. A facial reconstruction was created in July of 1989 and provided the public with their first look at the woman found nearly two years beforehand. Authorities believed that the woman's remains had been resting there, beside Shaw Creek, for anywhere between one and five years at the time of her 1987 discovery. It was really impossible for them to tell at the time, but her remains were decomposed to the point of police being unable to find any more evidence. This woman's remains have gone unidentified for over 30 years, but it has not lessened the impact of her story. The mystery that is her identity has perplexed investigators for over three decades, and the larger, more terrifying question that of who killed her, has loomed large over her case and others. You see, this is just one of four victims found within this area over a six-year period. Two of the victims have been identified, while the other half remain enigmas. 
The four women have been linked together due to their geographical location, and it has been theorized that they all fell prey to the same killer, who has since gone unidentified. This is the story of the Shaw Creek Killer. Welcome to Unresolved. I am your host, Michael Whelan, and this episode is a continuation of the series I began a handful of episodes ago, with the disappearance of Danette and Jeanette Millbrook. I have since continued the common setting of that story, the vicinity of Augusta, Georgia, to include the stories of missing children Tiffany Nelson and Malakia Logan. Now I am setting my sights on a larger, more terrifying tale from Aiken, South Carolina. If you would like to support my efforts in bringing little-known stories like this one some much-needed attention, you could head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod to become a patron and help financially support the podcast. You can also head to unresolved.me, the podcast website, to learn some more. And you could help out by supporting the sponsors of the podcast. Today's episode of Unresolved is brought to you by True Crime Magazine. True Crime Magazine is an awesome publication that provides an in-depth look at crimes, criminals, and the criminologists that try to piece it all together. If you head to thecrimemag.com unresolved, you can claim one of their exclusive limited time offers. This will get you a two-year subscription, valued at over a hundred bucks, for only $20. And if you jump on this offer as soon as possible, you can nab two more best-selling true crime publications for little to no additional cost. Once again, the link to get your two-year subscription to True Crime Magazine is thecrimemag.com slash unresolved. One more time, that's thecrimemag.com slash unresolved. Before I continue into the story itself, I need to take a brief step back. The discovery of the first Aiken Jane Doe in November of 1987 would be the first major break in this case, but the story would stretch back into the year beforehand, when a woman named Jackie Council went missing. Jacqueline Marie Council was born on October 21st, 1956. Not much about her early life is publicly known. In fact, if you search out this woman, you'll be greeted by a couple of news stories from the local Augusta Chronicle, but very little else. What we do know about Jacqueline, more commonly called Jackie by those that knew her, is that in the fall of 1986, she had just celebrated her 30th birthday, and she was the mother to four children. On November 10th, 1986. Jackie dropped off her youngest child at school. After saying goodbye to this five-year-old son, she left, and she was never seen again. She was reported missing by family members later that evening, but her loved ones would be left without conclusion for years. A little over a year later, the remains of a young black woman were found in the area around Shaw Creek. I cannot tell you whether or not police originally believed the remains belonged to Jackie, but there is no mention of it in the police reports. Maybe it was the physical characteristics of the remains that stood out. The pronounced overbite, the prior knee and nose injuries, the history of cocaine use, etc. But police did not relate the two, and they wouldn't for some time. It wasn't until 1991, nearly five years after the disappearance of Jackie Council, and close to four years after the discovery of the first unidentified victim, that a second body would be found. On March 22nd, 1991, loggers were cutting down pine trees in the area off of South Carolina Highway 191, the same area south of Eureka, nearby Shaw Creek, where the 1987 Jane Doe had been found. A little after 10.30 that Friday morning, a call reported the finding of skeletal remains to the Aiken County Sheriff's Department. The police responded to the scene at approximately 11.06 a.m. and began examining the area for any clues. This body, just like the first set of remains found in 1987, had been left nude. 
Sue Townsend, the Aiken County Coroner, would state that this body had been there for years. Very few details of this find have been released, such as the cause of death. Because of this scant amount of clues and deteriorated remains, police would have to linger on the identity of this victim for the foreseeable future. A little under two years later, on January 25th, 1993, another body was discovered in this area, close to the border between Aiken and Edgefield County. This body, which bore a striking difference from the other two, was discovered at approximately 9.45 that Monday morning. The striking difference between this set of remains and the other two, found within the same mile and a half stretch of woods, was that these remains had been burned after the fact. Authorities surmised, based on the state of the remains, that this victim had been killed, allowed to decompose in one spot, and then relocated to this area in the woods. At that point, the body had been burned, which removed all of the soft tissue, such as the hair, eyes, cartilage, etc. All of which would have been very beneficial to identifying the remains. Because of this posthumous burning, it made the investigation much more difficult. Coroner Sue Townsend summarized that the body had been there anywhere between two and five years, and the cause of death was a wound to the back of the neck. Notes in the police report indicate a stabbing, so I'm inclined to go with that. Just like the other two victims, this set of remains had been left in the woods naked. There were no clothing or belongings to help police narrow down the search for whom she had been. Based on the remains, investigators were able to create a vague understanding of whom this woman had been in life. She had been in the approximate age range of 25 to 32. She had stood somewhere between 5 foot 4 and 5 foot 7. She had a slight to medium build. She was right-handed, and she had a set of protruding teeth. A few months later, May 21st, 1993, Sue Townsend, joined by her deputy coroner Tim Carlton and Aiken County Sheriff's investigator Robert Johnson, went back out to the woods along Shaw Creek to search for any more remains or clues. During this search, which was eventually interrupted by a call for Townsend to respond to another crime scene, the trio were able to find a tooth, or at least part of one, several bone fragments, and a vertebrae from the victim's spine. They used a metal detector, hoping to come across another shell casing or a vital piece of evidence, but no such luck was had this time. Later that year, 1993, would see the public release of the facial reconstruction from the second victim, whose remains had been found in 1991. The residents of Aiken and Augusta were now able to see what she had potentially looked like, in the hopes that someone could help identify her. Police struggled to make any real progress in this case over the coming year, with no major leads seeming to develop. However, in 1994, police would receive one of their first real tips, and it came from another police department in a nearby state. On March 15, 1994, the Aiken County Sheriff's Office was tipped off that a criminal named Frank Thaniel Potts, who had recently been arrested, may be a person of interest in what was beginning to look like a serial killer investigation. Frank Potts was a migrant worker who lived throughout the Southeast, namely Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and the Carolinas. However, he had traveled to work as far north as Illinois and Pennsylvania, having acquaintances and friends in every state along the way. Frank was known as a nice guy to his neighbors, with a sterling reputation for helping out friends in times of need. However, he was also a bit weird, having bought a cheap plot of land in northern Alabama and building himself a small cabin where he lived away from civilization. A survivalist, if you will. He was a migrant worker who would travel along the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast in search of seasonal employment. He would work for a time, and then move on, either when the mood struck or the job opportunities dried up. Frank Potts also had a dark side. Between 1982 and 1988, he had been imprisoned for molesting an 11-year-old girl in Florida, and he was released after serving only six years of a 15-year sentence. After being released in 1988 for good behavior, he continued being a migrant worker, traveling through the eastern half of the United States. A violent incident in 1992 put him back on the radar of law enforcement, when he was accosted by a game warden in Alabama. 
Potts had been hunting alongside his teenage son, Frank Potts Jr., but he wasn't wearing the proper equipment and he did not have a permit. Instead of facing the consequences of these actions, Potts responded by kidnapping the game warden and holding him at gunpoint. The gun he was using at the time, a Heckler & Koch MP5, stood out in investigators' minds. Not only was it illegal for Potts to own a firearm, you know, being a felon and all, it was a submachine gun valued upwards of $5,000. The game warden lived to tell the tale, but Potts continued his migrant lifestyle. Eventually, he was arrested in Florida in 1994 for molesting another 11-year-old girl, a charge which he was then convicted of and given a life sentence for. He would have to serve a minimum of 25 years in jail for the repeat offense, but that was not the end of his legal issues. When police searched his 40-acre lot in Alabama, where he had built his survivalist cabin in the woods, police found the body of a young man who had gone missing in April of 1989. His name was Robert Earl Gines, and he had been another migrant worker who had traveled the nation with his girlfriend and Frank Potts. Potts was convicted to a second life sentence for the murder of Gines, but he would not serve that sentence in an Alabama prison, unless his Florida life sentence for repeated child molestation got vacated, which would have been unlikely. Authorities originally stated their belief that Frank T. Potts, who traveled repeatedly throughout the Southeast and held relationships along trips to Illinois and Pennsylvania, may have been responsible for many more crimes. At one point, he was tied to anywhere between 13 and 15 additional murders in various states, but lack of evidence and the persistence of time has led to those leads going nowhere. At this moment in time, it is very unlikely that Frank Potts is the killer of these three women found along Shaw Creek in Aiken County, South Carolina. Not only is there no physical evidence to tie him to the crime, but the timing just doesn't really match up. Potts was imprisoned between 1982 and 1988, the time period in which the first two victims were likely abducted and then murdered. So, could he have killed the third victim? Possibly. However, that's just speculation because that victim bore much in common with the other two. Frank T. Potts may have been a criminal who did terrible things, but it was very unlikely that he committed these murders. All three victims remained unidentified for the next few years. Frank T. Potts was eliminated as a suspect almost as soon as he emerged, and the investigation continued to falter. A 3D facial reconstruction of the third victim, whose remains had been burned near the Edgefield County line, was released four years after her discovery in 1997. If you're familiar with the stories I've been telling you over the past few episodes, then I'm sure you're familiar with Shantae Sturgis, the younger sister of teenagers Danette and Jeanette Millbrook. In March of 1990, the twins disappeared from their old neighborhood in Augusta, Georgia, and their case was never followed up on. Links between their disappearances and these three Aiken County Jane Does weren't officially made for years, but Shantae, who was just reaching adulthood at this point in the mid-1990s, tried to make a connection between one of her missing sisters, Jeanette, and this body recovered three years after their disappearance. So... They took DNA, um, you know, they took DNA they got from Richmond County that my mom and them did, and then when we had the meeting with Roundtree, they did DNA on me also. Mm -hmm. And I guess they compared all that, and they still haven't told us anything. We still don't know who this person is or um, if they ever... Found out if it was, you know, connected to my family or whatever, but we still waiting. Mm -hmm. And you had that meeting with the Aiken Corner, did you say, last year? Yeah, we had a meeting with the Aiken Corner last year, and I forgot exactly what month it was, but they said it's, it's going to take a while because the person who did whatever to that person, um, I guess they got word that they was looking for them this person and they went back and burnt the bones mm -hmm. when they found the bones the bones was burnt so he said once they got them back there um they was did the reconstruction once they did the reconstruction 
they put it out there, but nobody still never came forward. And we was thinking they did because when we caught um, Richmond County, they told us that, oh, no, they weren't your sisters. I said, okay, you know, left it like that. But I know how can you tell me no, it wasn't them, but you never got no DNA. How could you compare it to what just yeah. by looking? Because everybody that's done seen it lately is saying the same thing that me and my mom thought back then when they first put it on the news, that it looked similar to yeah. her, you know. Even if it's not her, rule it out. And then the, the hair, all that matches up, you know what I'm saying, mm. Even though it might not be, but it, it it looks, it does look like. Over the years, Shantae has tried to demand that police follow up on this lead, but she has been met with relative silence. Testing was not done two decades ago, when Shantae first made this possible connection, and it's been impossible to find out whether it has been done since. It's indeed very possible that these remains do not belong to Jeanette Millbrook. However, it is a solid lead that investigators should continue to investigate until exhausted. If it is possible to identify another of these bodies, authorities should continue to attempt any forensic possibilities. I mention identifying another body because the late 1990s would see at least one of these Jane Doe's getting their identity back. In 1997, a forensic pathologist from the University of South Carolina helped out with the investigation. Using then cutting edge technology, this pathologist was able to superimpose a photo of Jackie Council over the skull of the body found in March of 1991. This pathologist concluded that the body did belong to Jacqueline Marie Council. Despite this finding, police continue to try and find a way to further confirm the identity of this victim. In November of 1999, they tested the DNA of the remains and compared it to a son of Jackie, named Tefilio. On November 16th, 1999, authorities held a meeting with the family of Jackie Council, who had been holding out hope for their missing loved one for over 13 years. They were told that the remains found over nine years prior, off of Shaw Creek and Highway 191, were indeed that of Jacqueline Council. Jackie's mother had long held out hope that her daughter was alive and well. Early rumors after her disappearance alleged that she had run away on a boat, a possibility that would have been cruel to her children and other loved ones, but a more inspiring proposition than this tragic reality. Sue Townsend, who had been the Aiken County Coroner for over a decade now, and had examined all three bodies and led the forensic investigation into identifying them, stated about this, Quote, Clearly we have somebody who has dumped three bodies in Shaw's Creek. This is the first step to find out who did that. Robert Johnson, the Aiken County Sheriff's investigator in charge of the case, also added, quote, The common denominator was that there was nothing found with them. There were no remains of clothing, no items normally carried by a woman in a purse. When we factor in that information, it raises the possibility that there is at least one more victim of the same killer. A victim who isn't usually tied to the murders of Jackie Council and the two Aiken Jane Doe's, but whose case cannot be ruled out as belonging to the same killer. Ristine Durden was born on February 6th, 1960. I wish I could tell you more about her, but there has been very little written about her or her story in the decades since. She had just turned 29 years old that February. She was last seen on March 13, 1989, in her Avra, Georgia home. Avra is a very small town, with a population just over 200, and it is about 45 minutes to an hour southwest of Augusta, Georgia. Tack on an additional 20 miles or so, and you could travel through Augusta to Aiken, South Carolina. Three years after her disappearance. After the first Aiken Jane Doe and the remains of Jackie Council had already been found along Shaw Creek. The body of another woman was found near Uncle Duck Road in rural Aiken County. This area, just off of Mount Pleasant Road and nearby Sawyer's Pond and Gilly Creek, is approximately 15 miles away from where the other three bodies would be found. For any of you astute listeners, Mount Pleasant Road may sound familiar. I mentioned a road of the same name in my last episode, in which I detailed the disappearance and investigation to find Malakia Logan in Greenville, South Carolina. As I have since learned, these are totally separate roads located roughly 60 miles apart from one another. 
Despite the 15 or so mile gap between these four related crimes, there were various similarities. Ristine Durden matched the same victim profile. She was a young black woman from the area, and just like the other victims, she had been left nude near a body of water. Police conducted a forensic reproduction of the victim's profile, which was then published in the Augusta Chronicle, the area's largest newspaper. A relative of Ristine Durden saw this facial reconstruction and contacted the authorities. Ristine had been reported missing back in 1989, so they had been eagerly awaiting any leads or updates in her case since. Dental records would later confirm her identity, but there has been very little movement in her case ever since. It is still very much open, and her killer, or killers, have never been identified. In March of 1993, a forensic anthropology professor from the nearby University of South Carolina led a class of students into the area where Ristine Durden's body had been found. Along with the Aiken County coroner, Sue Townsend, they scoured the woods along Uncle Duck Road, hoping to find any more clues or evidence. They did not find much, but they were able to find some more bone fragments, which had belonged to the young woman. They were returned to her body, but the mystery of how they, and she, had ended up there persisted. When I began researching this story, I was completely and totally unaware of Ristine's case. Her story hasn't really been publicized in the media since, with the Aiken Standard having no mention of her case, and any articles from the Augusta Chronicle, save for just one, being archived long ago. She hasn't really been officially tied to the case, but I think it's too much of a coincidence for there to be another murdered woman found without any clothing or belongings in the same area at the same time as three other victims. It's very possible that she fell prey to the same killer, who has since gone unidentified in the decades since. Before I continue on in the episode, I need to talk for a minute about the proximity of Aiken, South Carolina, to Augusta, Georgia. I know that I've thrown out the names of both pretty casually this episode, so it might be a little confusing. Both towns sit pretty closely to the border between Georgia and South Carolina. If you look at both towns on the map, they seem to be about 20 to 30 miles apart, but I don't think that really does the area enough justice. Augusta is pretty firmly on the border between the two states. I live in this area, and there are some roads that will weave you in and out between South Carolina and back into Georgia. In fact, there's even a section of Augusta, called North Augusta, which sits on the other side of the Savannah River. It's officially a town in South Carolina. Aiken, on the other hand, is solely in South Carolina. However, it is very easily accessible by people in Augusta. If you go to the Wikipedia page for Aiken, you'll see that the entire county is included in the Augusta metropolitan area, which includes a total of seven counties, five in Georgia, and then Aiken and Edgefield counties from South Carolina. I just wanted to briefly touch on this, because most of the suspects I will be bringing up have ties to the Augusta area. However, you should know that despite Aiken and Augusta existing in different counties and neighboring states, that they are generally grouped together. So, with that out of the way, let's talk about a potential suspect for these killings. This is a person of interest that was brought up on the Fall Line podcast, and remains one of the most convincing suspects for these crimes and others. His name was Joseph Patrick Washington. Joseph Patrick Washington lived in Augusta, Georgia, at 104 Hale Street, and worked for the Mary Brick Brickyards. Both locations were in the same area that Danette and Jeanette Milbrook, Augusta's missing twins, lived in and visited on the night of their disappearance. Washington wasn't a very big guy, standing only 5 feet and 4 inches tall, but he was described as being stocky and strong for his size. In 1993, Washington was arrested in connection to a series of violent rapes that had taken place in the Augusta area. All of the crimes carried a common theme. They were perpetrated against young women who were kidnapped at gunpoint, ordered to get into Washington's vehicle, and then taken to a second location. He would then sexually assault them, and then shoot them in the stomach and leave them for dead. The victim profile remained largely the same. They were all young black women with short hair, who ranged in age from their late teens to late thirties. Some of the victims were sex workers, and others seemed to be victims of opportunity. In a similarity to the victims in Aiken County, the victims were often left at the second location without any clothing or belongings. 
those that did survive told a pretty common story, including how their attacker claimed to have gotten HIV from an ex-girlfriend, and stated that these violent rapes were his psychotic way of seeking vengeance against the fairer sex. He was eventually convicted on over 25 charges of rape, assault, sodomy, kidnapping, and robbery. It was a death sentence in all but name. But police were preparing a death penalty trial against him for the murders of two women, Marilyn Denise Kelly and Loretta Dukes. Both were women who lived in the Augusta area, who authorities believed Washington had sexually assaulted and then killed, this time by shooting both of them in the head. Ronnie Strength then chief deputy of the Richmond County Sheriff's Office, shared his thoughts with the Augusta Chronicle. Quote, Without a doubt, we are convinced that Mr. Washington is responsible for the two homicides, and is a prime suspect in the third from 1991. Despite the police believing him to be guilty of the two crimes, and potentially a third unnamed case, he never stood trial for the murders. That's because Washington's health deteriorated over the next few years while behind bars heavily rumored to be because of his HIV progressing into AIDS. Authorities were not able to reveal the official cause of his 1999 death, due to privacy laws, but that's the common belief. Because he can no longer stand trial for the murders he was accused of committing, those cases are closed but officially unsolved. However, many have theorized that Washington may have been the perpetrator in more than just those crimes. The Fall Line podcast makes a very convincing argument that Washington may have been responsible for the disappearance of Danette and Jeanette Milbrook. After examining the case of the three Shaw Creek victims, as well as the unsolved murder of Ristine Durden, I think it's impossible to rule Washington out as a person of interest in the crimes. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation took DNA from Washington's three vehicles and his home, which they hopefully still have on file. Only time will tell whether interest in the case spurs the GBI to test that DNA against the separate cases. That of both the Millbrook disappearance and the Shaw Creek slayings, which would require the cooperation of South Carolina. John Wayne Boyer was easily identified by his grandfatherly Santa Claus-esque appearance. He stood about 5 feet 7 inches tall, weighing in close to 300 pounds, and he was bald with a big beard full of graying white hair. When he was arrested in 2007, he became known nationwide as the Long Haul Territory Killer, and his story has been adapted for TV shows such as Criminal Minds. Boyer first popped up on the radar of law enforcement after the body of a young woman named Scarlett Wood was found in 2004. She had been a hotel maid who disappeared from North Carolina's New Hanover County the year prior, in January of 2003, but her body would not be identified until 2006. At that point, police were easily able to trace back her steps on the night she disappeared to Boyer's hotel room, where the two had been engaging in some illegal drug activity together. Boyer was arrested at his mother's home in Augusta, Georgia, where he had been living for most of his life. After his arrest, Boyer showed aggressive behavior. In the interrogation room, he asked police, quote, what bitch are you here about? Police immediately suspected that he may have been responsible for more than just the one crime he was detained for, but he quickly confessed to taking drugs with Scarlett Wood and being there when she accidentally fell backwards and hit her head on a piece of furniture. At that point, after the alleged accident, he claims that he panicked and dumped her body nearby in an effort to be rid of her. He pled guilty to second-degree murder in his 2007 trial, and he was given a 12-year prison sentence. He was actually due to be released in 2017, until authorities discovered some more skeletons in his closet. DNA taken from him during the trial of Scarlett Wood's death matched up with another cold case from Tennessee, in which a 25-year-old named Jennifer Smith had been found dead in April of 2005. Her body had been found in an abandoned parking lot off of Interstate 40. When questioned, Boyer confessed to this crime as well, and told the story. He stated that Jennifer Smith was a sex worker he picked up in his semi-truck, and he took her to the abandoned parking lot she was eventually found in. While they were haggling over money, he eventually lost his cool, strangled Smith, and dumped her body outside of his truck. Her case had gotten nowhere for over two years, until the DNA happened to match up with John Wayne Boyer. He has since been released from his murder conviction in the death of Scarlett Wood, and he was transferred to a Tennessee prison where he is unlikely to ever be a free man again.
However, police have not stopped trying to match up potential cases with Boyer, including another sex worker from South Carolina. Michelle Hagedon was found in April of 2000, having been strangled with a wire or a cord. Her body was left in a parking lot along Interstate 20, just outside of Florence, South Carolina, roughly two hours northeast of Aiken. Detective Scott Smith, of Tennessee's Hickman County Sheriff's Office, stated about the possibility of other potential victims. Quote, I think there are a lot more. There's no telling. This guy traveled all over the country. Hopefully, we'll get more of these cases solved through DNA. Boyer's own defense attorney, H. Lawrence Shotwell, shared a pretty similar thought with reporters. Quote, It wouldn't surprise me if there's other stuff out there. I have absolutely nothing other than a gut instinct on that. Authorities believe that John Wayne Boyer, the long-haul territory killer, as he's known, may have many more victims out there. He traveled extensively through Tennessee and the Carolinas, and he lived in the Augusta metropolitan area for almost all of his life. In 2011, after Boyer's misdeeds had been made public, the Aiken County Sheriff's Office stated publicly that the four victims found along Shaw Creek, including Ristine Durden, may have been the victim of a single killer who was possibly a long-haul trucker. After all, all four of the bodies were found just a short distance away from I-20, which is a major interstate that cuts through South Carolina. However, while these comments and Boyer's own past paint a very unflattering picture, I personally find it unlikely that he is the man responsible for these four murders. Now, he has definitely proven himself to have the temperament for this type of crime, but the three victims that police have named in his case, Scarlett Wood, Michelle Hagedon, and Jennifer Smith, were all slightly built white women. They were found in various locales, separated by time and distance. Meanwhile, the four victims from Shaw Creek were all black women, ranging from smaller to medium builds, and they were found nude along the waterways of Aiken County. Additionally, the victims that Boyer is accused of killing were a good distance away from his own home. The Aiken County victims were just a quick trip away from his own backyard. Whether or not John Wayne Boyer had more victims is up for debate. However, I find it unlikely that he is the serial killer that left bodies along Shaw Creek. Shaw Creek is spawned from the South Fork Edisto River, which is one of North America's longest rivers. Shaw Creek carries water all the way from just north of Aiken State Park, out to the area north of Trenton, South Carolina, just east of the city of Edgefield. For approximately 32 miles, Shaw Creek carries water into various outlets, other creeks, ponds, rivers, and reservoirs. For most of those 32 miles, Shaw Creek is surrounded by forest, which hold more secrets than the creek itself. One of the creepiest things about living in the southeast is that, no matter where you are, so much of the surrounding area is undeveloped. Dark, swampy woods where countless killers have tried to hide their secrets over the years. I've told you about a few today. Frank Thaniel Potts, Joseph Patrick Washington, and John Wayne Boyer. There are a handful of others that I haven't mentioned, because they haven't really presented themselves during my research, and I don't think that they're really involved in this case. Some of these killers include Richard Daniel Starrett, who lived in Martinez, Georgia, just west of Augusta, and who was arrested in 1989 for kidnapping and raping one young woman, and for murdering another. Police referred to him as the second coming of Ted Bundy, and he lived in proximity to these four victims. Another is Rinaldo Javier Rivera, a notorious killer who lived in Augusta, Georgia for years. At the turn of the century, he was arrested for raping and murdering four women between 1999 and 2000. Many have theorized that he could have been involved in these crimes, even though, again, the victim profile and the methods of operation were completely different. Then there's Henry Lewis Wallace, also known as the Taco Bell Killer, who lived half an hour southeast of Aiken in a town called Barnwell, South Carolina. He was a drug addict who killed and raped at least 10 women between his hometown and Charlotte, North Carolina, and he is rumored to have been involved in various other sexual assaults and crimes. All of these killers, these nightmarish excuses of men, 
are just possibilities I'm floating out there. I like to bring these suspects to the surface because the idea of them being the culprit, a known evil, make the case easier for my mind to comprehend. However, the reality is that it's likely, and unfortunately, none of the men I've mentioned in this episode. The culprit is probably still out there, having never had to worry about handcuffs shackling his wrists together and being led to face judgment for his various crimes. Despite not knowing the identity of this unknown killer, or killers, we do know a few things. We know that the first Aiken County Jane Doe, found in 1987, had been laying along Shaw Creek for anywhere between one and five years. That puts her time of death somewhere between 1982 and 1986. We also know that Jackie Council went missing on November 10th, 1986. Her body was found in 1991 and later identified in 1999, but she went missing right at the tail end of 1986. We know that Ristine Durden disappeared on March 13, 1989, from Avera, Georgia. Her body was found in the same geographic area as the others, and while she hasn't been officially tied to the crimes, statements by police as recently as 2011 indicate that she probably belongs to the same unknown killer. The second Aiken County Jane Doe, found in 1993, had been burned, but police were able to theorize that she had been stabbed in the back of the neck, and she had been laying there for anywhere between two and five years. That would put her approximate time of death in the range of 1988 to 1991. So, you have two crimes that took place in the mid-1980s, and two crimes that took place a few years later. The next question we need to ask ourselves is, why? Why were these victims chosen? Jackie Council and Rustine Durden were both regular Janes, with not a lot that set them apart from one another. Jackie was 30 years old, and Rustine was 29. The 1987 Aiken Jane Doe was theorized to be between 17 and 30 years old, while the 1993 Aiken Jane Doe was theorized to be between 25 and 32. So, Almost all of the victims seem to be in their mid to late 20s, bordering on 30. The 1987 Aiken Doe had hair test positive for cocaine, and that's perhaps why the 1993 Aiken Doe was found disinterred and then burned. Perhaps the killer did not want a link being found to either drugs or prostitution, but that's just me spitballing. There are so many more questions I wish I could ask, but the details of this case seem to be lost with time. It has been almost 30 years since some of the most recent updates for this case, and many of the people involved, family, friends, neighbors, have either moved or passed on. On Friday, March 9th, I was able to visit Aiken County, where I met with a representative of the sheriff's office. He allowed me to look over the case files, which he joked suffered from the issues many government agencies have had with documents that are over 20 years old. They had not been curated in a computerized format, so there was a fair amount of illegible writing and, potentially, information and documents lost over the years. The pages of the file contained many details and notes that investigators and county coroner Sue Townsend had made during the investigation. I saw that they had made numerous attempts to try and match up the Aiken Does with missing people from surrounding counties and states, but they seemed to have had no luck with that. The case file that I looked over was invaluable to the research for this episode. It contained many pieces of info that would be impossible to find anywhere else. After all, these four victims, Jackie Council, Ristine Durden, and the two Aiken Jane Does, have gotten very little media coverage. Outside of a brief overview on the Fall Line podcast, and a handful of articles published in the Augusta Chronicle over the last three decades, most of which are now archived, these four women are essentially ghosts. There are no documentaries that have chronicled their lives, no books that have tried to retrace their steps, nothing. Just a local journalist or two, and a few podcasters that have tried to make do with what we have. And what we have, unfortunately, isn't much. I struggled with this story because, sadly, there's just not a lot of information out there about these four victims. I had originally titled this episode The Aiken Does, and I wanted to focus on the two unidentified victims. They have often been tied to the various crimes from the area, in particular the Millbrook twins, so it made sense for me to try and address them. 
But the more that I learned, the more I realized that they were a story of their own. Not just the two Aiken Does, but Jackie Council and Rustine Durden as well. If you google the Shaw Creek Killer, which is the title of this episode, you won't really come up with anything. You may find a news story or two regarding the Aiken Does or the two other named victims, but that's about it. That's because police have only publicly theorized that these four women fell prey to the same killer. After looking at the documents provided by the Aiken County Sheriff's Department, it's become pretty clear that these four women were related. Not only because of their proximity to one another, but the state that they were found in, and the period of time in which they were killed. So, without sounding too full of myself, I took it upon myself to put a name to this unknown killer. The Shaw Creek Killer. I think that's how we help raise awareness that whoever he or she is, they have at least four victims to their name, and they have never been brought to justice. I wish that there was more I could do or say, but for the time being, the stories of Jackie Council, Ristine Durden, and the Aiken Jane Doe's remain unresolved. Thank you for listening to Unresolved. If you want to stay in touch with myself or the podcast, you can find it on either Facebook or Twitter. The Twitter handle is at UnresolvedPod, and the Facebook page can be found at facebook.com slash unresolvedpod. There is also a Facebook discussion group, where myself and others post about unsolved cases, past and present, and some other fun stuff. If you would like to send in an email, you can deliver them to theunresolvedpodcast at gmail.com. You could also send in emails to me personally at michael at unresolved.me. And as I say every episode, that's Michael with the E before the A. I may not respond to your emails and messages immediately because I've developed a pretty bad case of scatterbrain lately, but I will eventually, I promise. If computers aren't your thing, you can even text or call into the podcast voicemail line at 831 200 3550. Once again, that's 831-200-3550. Again, I may not respond immediately, but I always try to get back to you in a pretty timely manner. All of this information can be found at the podcast website, which is unresolved.me. There, you can find transcripts of each episode, any sources for further reading, and a link to the Patreon page where you can help financially support the podcast. I'm almost done, I promise, but if you like my style of storytelling, make sure to subscribe to the podcast Hoax. That's another venture I'll be launching on the first day of April, and I plan to upload the first three episodes at the same time. If you like Unresolved, I think you'll really love the first episode of Hoax at the very least. Anyhow, I'll probably be taking the next week off to try and catch up on some stories I'm working on, but I will be bringing you another Unresolved story in the very near future. Stay tuned everyone, and I'll talk to you very, very soon.